As you know, on Sunday night or Monday morning of every week, we post a new expository semiotics explaining why we would choose which lectionary readings. But in these readings, our dream is and our, our desire is to help you read the signs and fondle the details and spot the seminal metaphors, the condensed signs and the stories that are a key for preaching to a digital culture. So strap on your seatbelt and join us as we prospect our passages for today. This is the 19th Sunday after Pentecost, the middle, almost the middle of October, if you can believe it, 11th of October. This is vlog number 30. And the lectionary readings are as follows. The Exodus text is the very famous story about the golden calf at Horeb. And that's Exodus, the 32nd chapter, verses 1 to 14. And the, there's so much could be done with that, but I've been in Exodus um, a lot in the past couple months, so we're going to, to bypass the, the golden calf and, and the golden calves that we worship, um, the, that we still dance around and, and gather around, whether it be places like Hollywood and Wall Street, or whether it be people celebrities that we gather around and worship. The, the psalm is uh, Psalm 106, 1 to 6, 19 to 23. Um, it's a great psalm, um, some very resonant phrases in it. It's interesting to me that when the translators of the King James, 1611, would um, periodically meet, they would come together and just meet, and they would take what they had translated and read it to each other out loud because the words weren't going to be right if the words didn't sound right. That's the importance of hearing. And the Psalms were meant to be sung, and they're meant to be heard. And I love that, even though most of the King James is just stealing from William Tyndall, what he did in 1526 and, and subsequently. But they would gather together just to share out loud their translations. And then we'll talk about how does this sound. I think personally, the Bible that reads the best in public is the Jerusalem Bible. Um, the one that Tolkien, actually, the, the first one, there's a new Jerusalem Bible I'm not as familiar with as the, the original. But it just has this incredible sounding forth the of the, of the scriptures, and you can almost tell that those who, who, who translated it um, didn't just translate it on a page, they, they translated it orally. Um, the, the Matthew text uh, is the parable of the, the wedding banquet, and um, many call a few chosen is this strange, almost cryptic remark here. But if you remember the story, um, King's son is getting married, and he invites a lot of people, and a lot of people don't want to come. And so he goes into the highways and byways and, and invites everybody to come. And, and there's one guest, though. When, when you come to a wedding banquet, and this, this is why context is so important, in, in, in the time of Jesus is telling this, everybody that comes to a wedding banquet gets a, a garment, the same garment, so that... You can't tell who is who. In other words, what socioeconomic level you are, uh, rich, poor, what, what you do for a living. So everybody's equalized in that garment. And that garment makes everybody equal and gives everybody a, um, an equal place at the table at these, at Jesus's especially, uh, wedding banquet. And when some, this one guy in particular, refused to put on the wedding garment, he wanted everybody to know who he was. Um, that's when Jesus is saying, you know, I've invited everybody and uh, few, few come, but even some who do come can't give up their, their righteousness, their superiority, their sanctimoniousness, and they are dismissed. 
So this is the one that I would choose, is one of my most favorite passages in all of the scriptures, Philippians 4. Here we go. And I always start at verse 4. I mean, it tells you to start at verse 1, but we're going to start at verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, what? Rejoice. Now, you got to remember where Paul's writing this from. He's writing this from jail. The, the story, you can read about Paul's being jailed here in Philippi with, with Silas in, in Acts 16. And it tells you the story of their, their, their imprisonment. But here, one of the most joyous passages in all the Scripture. And when you think about Paul, you, you kind of think of this dour, sour guy. He, some of the most jubilant, joyful passages come from, from Paul. And here from Paul, in prison. He's chained. He's in prison. Now, he does face imprisonment and, and the possibility of death. He learned from Jesus, maybe, um, because he does face it with song. And you read about the song that he and Silas sang, and the, you remember? The earth trembled, and the chains fell, and the guard that was supposed to take care of them and, and, and keep them um, contained um, almost took his own life because he knew better than that than be tortured uh, for letting them out. Paul is facing crisis with a song. And will somebody out there, somebody please, portray Jesus singing? I mean, please, somebody. Nobody in history has ever done a picture. I mean, we have pictures of Jesus doing everything else, eating, praying, healing, playing with kids, sleeping even. We got pictures of Jesus doing everything, but no one has ever portrayed Jesus singing. And how does he meet the, the, the crisis of the cross and Calvary? He, well, first of all, in the upper room, when the supper was over, he sang a hymn. We know what the hymns he sang with his disciples, and they would have gathered in the middle of this triclinium table, and they would have sung the Hallel Psalms 114, 118, all of them. Because at Passover meal, you sing all of them. Other days of Passover, you can sing. Just... So they would have danced and sang it together. And then on the cross, again, he continues the psalm singing with Psalm 41, uh, 31. He sings Psalm 31. And then the most, most incredible, meaningful, um, important song ever sung in the history of the world, and we missed it. Psalm 22 from the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he sings this whole psalm. Now. But nobody's ever portrayed Jesus um, ushering himself into eternity. Now, I, I don't know. You know, he's got three Marys and, and John there, and whether they might have somehow supported him by joining him in that song. Uh, I don't know. But nobody. Where's the, where's the biblical imagination, church, to get Jesus singing? And, and Paul is singing. And part of the singing is this rejoicing. And this is kind of a hymn. You know, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let everyone come to know your gentleness. The Lord is at hand. And then he, he's, he's working towards the peace that passes all understanding will guide your hearts and guide your minds in Christ Jesus. But how do you get to that peace that passes all understanding? Some translations have it, the peace that surpasses all imagining, all understanding. Well, Paul gives us a formula, and here it is. You ready? It says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with gratitude, Make your request known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will protect your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Um, now, this is as close to a formula as you will get to how do you enter into that state of shalom. But not just a, a, a shalom that goes beyond what they've known as shalom, because it's a peace that passes all understanding. And it's only found in Jesus. 
But how do you get there? And Paul says, let me read it again. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with gratitude, make your request known to God. Let me give you my translation. This is the Lens Suite translation of the Greek here. Be anxious in nothing. Be prayerful in everything. Be thankful in anything. Then the peace that passes all understanding. So how do you get to that peace that passes and surpasses all that we can ever ask or think? The the the, the ultimate in shalom, the Jesus shalom. Let me repeat, be anxious in, remember, nothing. Be prayerful in, remember, everything. Be thankful in, remember, now this is the hard one. And that's why it's the last, because I don't think you can get to this one unless you pass through the first two. Be thankful in anything. You've heard of the seven last words of the church, right? You know what they are. We never did it that way before. I call this the seven first words of a Christian, the seven first words of, of the church, because Christians are part of a community. And I've reduced this little kind of Pauline formula to get to the peace into a little mantra. And the mantra is very simple, it's seven words. So remember, it's be anxious in nothing. So anxious, nothing, prayerful, everything, thankful, anything, peace. So the seven first words, may, maybe of a day, of, of, of discipleship, um, I, I, I sometimes will say this, you know, silently to myself, sometimes mutter it. I use it as kind of a mantra. Christians have mantras too, you know, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. I, that's another mantra of mine. But, but anxious, be anxious in nothing. Now, this, this echoes something that Jesus said, remember, when, when he's talking about worry and um, he talks about... Um, that you you be you should not um, uh, be worry. Do not be anxious um, as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you shall put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Now the when it says be not anxious, it's an imperative. So that's why you can just say anxious. Nothing. It's an imperative. Be anxious in nothing. And many of us, I mean, we, we go around so worried and fretful and anxious. And there, There's an old saying, and I forget where I heard this, but worry is the dark room where negatives are developed. Worry is the dark room where negatives are developed. And the, so the people that are worried the most and fretful the most, they're the, they're the most um, you got jittery, uh, the most skittish, um, the most, um, well, wrinkled, if you will, with worry. And... No, I mean, w the faith of a Christian is not based on anxiety and, and stress and, and worry and fret. And we, it's, it's been hard to learn this. I mean, why, why do you live the virtuous life. Why do you live virtuous? It's not because you're afraid of something and you're anxious about this, you don't want to, but it's because you want to embrace the new and the, the, the future and you want to embrace all of the good. Not afraid of the bad, but embrace the good. And our ancestors, they, they didn't get this always right. I mean, I, I have something here. It really belongs in a museum. It's, it's really that rare. It's called a fire devil. Have you ever seen a, a fire devil? Here, here's, here it is, right here. It should be in the fireplace, but... Um, but this is, this would hang on the damper. And, and this is about maybe, maybe 1710, 1720. So it would hang on the damper. And when you pulled open the damper for the fire and lit the fire, your kids and you 
could see in the fireplace the devil. And this got really hot. And as the fire got hot, it got hot. And so it reminded you of your future if you weren't good. And so this is the this is where we didn't get exactly get it right because now we're trying to build a faith on anxiety about the you know am I going to end up in heaven or hell and what what is my no you you embrace Jesus and you follow Jesus not not for the the fear of hell but for the the enticement and enchantment and the embrace of of heaven and and the good and the beautiful and the true and so the anxious in nothing, um, the worried, crinkled brow, the, all that comes with the, that, that state of worryment. No, just let it go. Anxious in nothing. I mean, who, who, who is your heavenly father? Who is looking out after you? And it is God, and you couldn't have a better parent. You could not have a better father. You could not have a better um, guardian. Uh, you could not trust anybody more. So anxious and nothing. But the, the second one is the meat of the sandwich. You got a sandwich here, you know, the meat of it. Prayerful in what? Remember? Everything. So anxious, nothing, prayerful everything in everything by prayer and intercession and supplication and this is where we get we get it wrong um we talk about the lord's prayer it's not really the lord's prayer it's the disciples prayer jesus this is not the prayer that jesus prayed it's the prayer jesus said this is your prayer but it's all right for us i mean the real lord's prayer is in in john 17. father pray that you may be one even as we are one and all that goes with that but you can still call it, and I can still call it the Lord's Prayer, if the point is not to pray it, if the point is to become it. I mean, the ambition of a disciple's life is to become a Lord's Prayer. Everything you do is a prayer offering to God, is, is, a, is a prayer. Everything. When you eat, when you sleep, when you study, it's all done in this attitude of prayer. I have a study, but you have to bow to get into it because there's an old Hebrew saying, an hour of study in the eyes of God is an hour of prayer. There's another Hebrew saying, when you sing, you pray twice. So everything, whether it's singing, studying, playing, um, out in the field with soccer, it can all be prayerful in what? everything. And then the hard one is the last one, and that is thankful in in anything. Um, and it, it really means anything here. You say anything, yeah, anything. I mean, even in the worst times, yeah, even in the worst times. Even when it seems like the, the sky is falling, like now, <laughs> in a COVID world, or, yeah. Because you can always find something to be thankful for, and 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 see, we, we have we, we live out of this spirit of gratitude, and in many ways, the root of all sin is ingratitude. I say it again, in gratitude. Um, one of the most important things for a parent to do is to teach their children gratitude. Now, parents resist this. And you may have done it yourself. I don't need thanks for my kids. I'm not doing it for their thanks. I'm doing it because I love them. Yeah, you may not need them to say thank you, but they need to learn to say thank you. Because if they don't, then they grow up with either a sense of entitlement, well, I'm here, so I deserve this, or the sense of achievement, I earned this, I did this myself. Where's the gratitude? No, everything that we have is a gift. And to live in that spirit of gratitude just... I mean, the most important words anybody can hear in life and in death. I love you. Please forgive me. Thank you. I mean, it all comes down to that, those three words. Um, I love you. Thank you. Forgive me. Another seven words. 
of healing and hope. The most important words that every human being needs and wants to hear. I love you. Forgive me. I don't do I'm sorry because forgive me is so much more important than I'm sorry. So much more, so much deeper. And then thank you. So the seven first words. The path of discipleship, a mantra for every day. Anxious, nothing. Prayerful, everything. Thankful, anything. Peace. May the peace of the Lord, the peace that passes all understanding, guide your hearts and guard your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Semiotics is the art of angling, of turning things askew, upside down, inside out, cattywampus, sunny side up, over easy, scrambled, hard boiled. We hope you enjoyed today's journey, but always remember, it's more important you prepare the preacher than you prepare the sermon.